So we've got BuzzFeed on one side and we've got Gawker on the other side, uh, kind of in the book. And there are these two uh, tales, if you will. I think if you went on the street and you ask people who pay attention, but maybe aren't inside the media, uh, there's a generalization that like BuzzFeed is like a positive uh, place that's like cool and they have the listicles and like maybe some people think it's like kind of like dumber content when it was really going viral right but it's like very much positive oriented and i think that they think about it as like hey they don't really do harm gawker on the other hand i think people again generalization would be like oh those people are constantly tearing people down and there's like some negativity associated with it etc i'm not saying yeah. whether those are fair no, i think that's about, i think that's true i think if you ask people who worked at those places that's how they saw it. buzzfeed slogan or when i got there was no haters um then yeah like could be dumb and and gawkers believed in what they would call a kind of ruthless honesty mm. and you know when they were like they started they were like a little blog written by these kind of clever young women in new york who would like infiltrate the condé nast cafeteria and write about how ridiculous it was which was sort of like genuinely kind of harm not like harmless fun and you know picking on much bigger more powerful institutions that that deserve to be poked at and I do think that, but, but there were these two very different philosophies of like, what is the internet going to be like? Like Jonah, who founded BuzzFeed, really thought as people start to like share things in public on social media, they're going to share positive stuff that makes them look good. I mean, we definitely had a specific theory that there's no way people are going to share divisive political content because it makes you look like a crazy person. Like who would do that? That did not turn out to be a true theory. <laughs> um, and Gawker had this other approach, which was that the thing the internet can really do is say the things that you would never say before to like the, you know, just to like journalists, you talk to a journalist about their story and they're really fun and interesting to talk to. And they give you all this gossip and then you read the story and it's really boring. And Gawker was going to be like, no, we're going to say the stuff that we say to each other in bars, but not, but, but not in person. I mean, it turns out sometimes you don't say that stuff because it's incredibly malicious or mean. And as Gawker grew more powerful and more of a cultural force, suddenly it's less fun in games and it's more like this big, scary culture, you know, publisher is attacking random civilians. And I think they didn't, I mean, I definitely have felt this. I'm sure you felt this. If you start a media thing and it's little and you're a weirdo outsider, and then suddenly you're kind of a powerful player and it's a weird adjustment to realize like, Oh, suddenly I have power and that comes with some responsibility. And I think Gawker accumulated all this power and reach and scale and audience and never quite got it around its head around that that puts you in a different position and you're no longer the kid throwing spitballs in the back of the class. It's interesting because um, I didn't understand this uh, kind of phenomenon, if you will, until uh, when I first started writing on the internet, it was very much like, if you're punching, you can only punch up. Right, like there's literally right. no one below yeah, you. Yeah, because right? you're on the you're on the floor. Totally, I remember <laughs> like, that too. Like, like literally, there, there is no punching down because literally there's no one below you. Yeah. Um, but as you get bigger audiences, and it's not even necessarily like more power. I actually think just like size of audience, right? It, yes, that equates somewhat to power. But like even if people don't yes, even care, that, that is power. It, yes, and they're just you know kind of listening or whatever. Somebody once said to me, you know, once an email crosses a certain uh, size of audience, like you'd be the number one article on a CNBC.com every single day if that was listed as just an article and not an email newsletter or you know take a tweet and how many impressions it gets or, or whatever and so they were like again that doesn't mean that like you should go and do that that doesn't mean that it's a replacement for that stuff it's just it's different type of content but to give you a sense right. of like comparing audience sizes like you very quickly can accumulate a large audience yeah. on these other uh, platforms and so if we go back to this idea of like buzzfeed and gawker when BuzzFeed started to go more into like I'll call it like the serious journalism. It almost felt like virality was a yeah, way and that's when that's when I got there. That was sort of my job exactly. Yeah. And it felt like virality was really the way to grow an audience. And then it almost felt like okay, now we have to get serious and like build a business. We have to actually do real journalism, like all that type of stuff. Is that something that now in hindsight, knowing everything you know about what worked, what didn't work, etc., a playbook that you think people will follow, or do you feel like um, you know when you start the company today? It doesn't seem like you're like, oh, let's go viral, right? It actually seems like you're like, no, let's do like great work from day one and build an audience that has like a different brand promise than maybe what BuzzFeed had in the early totally. days. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, you know, people want to find sort of like big sweeping generalizations about the media business. And as you know, it's just like a weird, hard business and there are lots of different corners. And I think it's worth understanding with these big viral companies that grew so big, raised so much money, hired so many people, BuzzFeed and Vice, probably the biggest, like, here's what they were, here's what we were thinking, which was that in the 1980s, some entrepreneurs rolled cable lines out across the country and rolled wires into people's homes. 
And to get people to adopt them, they needed MTV. They needed CNN. And they knew from the start that they needed to pay a huge share of the money they were taking in to MTV, to CNN, to ESPN, to get people to look at these, you know, to, to turn on the televisions and plug them in. And the core of that cable business model was there's distributors with who own the wires, there's media companies who own who, who create the content, and there's got to be some financial arrangement where everybody gets rich or the whole thing doesn't work. Um, and the, the theory that Vice and BuzzFeed and others were operating under fundamentally was there's this new form of distribution. It's Facebook, it's Snap, it's Twitter, it's Pinterest. And as those guys compete with each other, as they compete with everything else in the world, just like cable, they're going to start hiring media companies to make the content for them. They're not going to depend on user-generated content forever. Now, you can argue about whether that was totally delusional or whether things just didn't break that way, but they did not break that way. And the reason you see these companies going out of business is there are a lot of reasons. There's a lot of mismanagement. We did lots of stupid stuff. But the fundamental bet, the fundamental thing that people were putting in hundreds of company investors were putting hundreds of millions of dollars into those companies was that bet. And I think that's just the notion that you're going to build your company as a supplier of content to a social platform that will somehow pay you, that that would be insane to try to do today. And so instead, I think what most, what really all cross media people are doing is trying to find an audience who's really interested in what you're doing and building a one-to-one relationship with them that isn't mediated by some platform. Um, yeah. And so, but that's a, that's not a business where you can reach a billion people on your first day either.